Welcome back to this tu- uh, beautiful Tuesday morning on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, and I am honored and pleased to have uh, actually to go back to my roots of covering politics and being in <laughs> politics back in Ontario. I am honored to have Dr. Kate Graham, and I'm going to read out the many titles that she has because she has a long list of them. The vice chair of the 2022 campaign for the Ontario Liberals, the co chair of the 2022 platform for the Ontario Liberals, the London North Centre candidate for the Ontario Liberals, and past leadership candidate for the Ontario Liberals as well. Kate, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honour and a pleasure. What a treat for me too. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I, I, I start off all my interviews with any politician the same way, so you're no exception. Where does your sense of duty to serve come from? Uh, I would say it comes probably from my parents. So I grew up in a household with two teachers as parents. My earliest sort of recollection of any form of political engagement was during the My Karis years that you will uh, probably recall as a longtime Ontario politico. And uh, it was the first time I, I kind of got a sense that, you know, decisions that were being made, I lived in Exeter, so it felt like hours and worlds away, but decisions that were being made uh, by people in positions of power uh, made a big impact and how it could, you know, could mean better or worse education, could mean healthier or less healthy communities. And so that was the first time I remember my parents getting pretty politically active. And, uh, and it came with it a sense uh, for me and my siblings that, you know, we live in a world that is shaped by choices and we have an opportunity and sometimes even an obligation to try to influence those choices where we feel it's threatening things that things are people around us that we care about. Um, to align yourself with one political party, especially in those formative Mike Harris years. I remember those quite well. I remember my parents doing the exact same thing, talking about politics at the dinner table. And that was my first introduction. Uh, Why the Ontario Liberals? Why did you align yourself with the Ontario Liberals? Because you had the Ontario NDP under Bob Ray in uh, sort of after when Mike Harris was there, uh, Lynn McLeod, the Ontario Liberals as well. What was the Ontario Liberals draw for you, uh, Kate? Sure. So I, um, I think like a lot of people, you know, I voted for more than one party before. Um, I did not feel uh, necessarily a connection to any any single political party. Each election was sort of its own moment and its own opportunity to think about all the parties and what they were representing. Uh, That changed for me uh, during the time when I was working as a public servant. I worked at the City of London for about 10 years and I was the director responsible for a number of things, but including government relations. So the city was looking for support from the provincial government for things like more mental health supports, uh, supervised consumption side at the time, an investment in our transit system, uh, better connections between London and other communities. And uh, it became painfully clear that these were things that my community needed that were not going to happen without more support from the province. So it was at a time where we had a liberal government and uh, my NPP, Deb Matthews, decided to step down. She asked me to run. And, uh, and I took a really hard look at, you know, there were things that were well in progress and we, we'd finally seen a commitment to a supervised consumption site. We finally saw a commitment to rapid transit. The party was not doing very well in the polls, uh, but I, I really wanted to see uh, that government continue. And I wanted to see a number of the things that had been committed to continue. Uh, you know, we didn't know that Doug Ford would be the leader at the time, but uh, we did know that a, a change to a provincial conservative government was was fairly likely. Um, And it felt like the moment, again, kind of back to the story about my childhood, it felt like a moment uh, where I needed to actually step up and show that, you know, go all in on a party that I wanted to see be able to continue on the things it was working on. So I left my job at the city, I became an Ontario Liberal member. And not very long later, I became the Ontario Liberal candidate. So it was really driven for me by a couple of issues that um, I really wanted to see uh, come through to fruition and knew that we needed a liberal government to see that happen. Um, for those who are listening and those who are watching, uh, that was in the 2018 election. That was the last the provincial election back in Ontario. The next one is scheduled for June of 2022. So literally just around yes. the corner from us here. Um, that election 
did not go the way the Liberals wanted. Uh, it was a referendum against <laughs> Kathleen Wynne, the Premier, but also the Liberals. Uh, yeah. You do have a new leader right now. You ran in that leadership race. We could talk about that, but mm -hmm. I, there's more things that I want to talk about. So in uh, just measure of time, I just want to make sure that we get to everything. Um, the Liberals are in third place right now. Mr. Del Duca, the new Liberal leader, is crossing the province, uh, and I've been following him on social media. He's doing a good job. He's busy. Yeah. <laughs> how does the how do the Liberals have to come back in the next election? Because it is COVID. It's a whole new game in Ontario with the COVID numbers that I'm seeing out of there. How do the Liberals have to connect with people in this new age of COVID politics? Mm -hmm. That is the question. So. <laughs> Uh, so as it says, I, I ran as a candidate for the first time in 2018, worst election result in our history. Uh, we went from majority government to uh, we lost official party status. And uh, after the election, um, I was a, a big part of something called the Listening Project, where we did extensive uh, interviews with every candidate who ran to say, what did you hear at the door? What went wrong? What did Ontarians have to say that we need to really take away from this election? And I actually think sometimes, you know, in the the arc of history, uh, a major defeat can be a real opportunity for regeneration and for a party to take a good hard look in the mirror. Uh, I think what happened, um, and this would be like a very simple way of expressing it, there's lots more detail under this, but would be that we, we really stopped listening. So after 15 years in power, we lost touch with you know, what particularly communities outside the GTA, rural communities cared about. They didn't feel like we were listening to them anymore. And so what you see today is actually a very different Ontario Liberal Party. And this was what we spent almost the whole leadership race talking about. It's what we spent the better part of the last three years talking about is how do we build the kind of party where it is not about power being held tight in the halls of Queen's Park, but instead it is a vehicle for people to make the kind of changes they want to see in their own communities. And so there's been a ton of work happening community by community, riding by riding. Uh, we have invested like hundreds, thousands, I don't know, of hours uh, into providing people with opportunities to share what they'd like to see from a future liberal government if we're given the privilege once again. So, so I think the way that oh, we... I apologize, continue. No, I was just, so to wrap that up, I know it's a long answer, but I think the way that we, uh, we, re, we rebuild is to show people that we heard them and to say, listen, there were things that we... Uh, where we went astray and we were no longer connected to the things that matter to you, but we have heard you and we can put forward a vision uh, that reflects what people care about. And I think that's how we win next year. There is a lot going on in Ontario right now, but the main focus yeah. that the next election is probably going to be uh, battled over is the response to COVID-19 and Doug Ford and Christine Elliott's handling of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, we can talk about the cabinet switches that they just recently announced and where they're trying to shore up support the PCs, but let's just focus on COVID right now and then we'll talk about a few other things. Um, sure. From the Ontario Liberals perspective, and I know you're not the leader, but you are a candidate. What are the people of London North Centre, your riding that you were running in, telling you yeah. about the response that this government has done around COVID-19? Sure. Well, I mean, I've been making phone calls and more recently, uh, since it's been safe, knocking on doors every week through the entire pandemic. And I would say there have been some big changes in the overall sentiment and kind of response to the government. People have a lot of sympathy for leaders right now. You know, nobody, nobody wanted this to happen. It's a really tough time to lead. And so I do think there's a healthy amount of leaders are doing their best and we cannot, you know, we, we need to give them the opportunity to not be perfect all of the time, especially in a time of crisis. So I think there's a fair bit of sort of goodwill, uh, generally speaking, across levels. That said, there are a couple of things where I, I think people feel uh, the provincial government has just missed the mark, and one of them would be on the safe return to school. I hear about this every single canvas. So early in the pandemic, you know, when we didn't know what a safe return to school looked like, it was unclear what we should be doing and so on. It was different than now where the experts have been very, very clear, you know, the ability for smaller class sizes, more space between them, ventilation in classrooms. Um, I hope the whole vaccine rollout is very thoughtfully done as we start to get into, um, you know, kids five to 11. Um, so I, I think people see that there were better options possible. Many people that I, I know and have talked to have kids returning to classes that are larger and even more packed. 
The worst uh, situation that I heard was someone whose kid didn't even have a desk when they got to school. They had to sit on the floor because there were so many kids in the room that it exceeded the number of desks. So that kind of thing just sends people through the roof. Uh, it feels too late in the game to have not figured this out, especially when the experts have been so clear in their advice. So, so I think generally speaking, people say, you know, the, our leaders are trying their best and it's a hard time to lead. But when it comes to things like safe return to school, uh, handling of long-term care, a few other things in healthcare, um, they feel like it is just, we have not met the mark. And I think that's the opportunity for us as liberals to put forward a plan and say, here is what we would do. Again, if given the privilege that would address the things that we know are, are bothering and, and uh, yeah, where people feel the most let down by our current provincial government. I, just on that note, uh, I, my mother works in the uh, school system and she knows quite well okay. that things came at the school system last year and she's since retired yes. this year, she's retired last minute. It was very last minute and things were up in the oh, air until like 24 hours, if not eight hours before schools open the next day. Um, yeah. When you're talking and you're making your phone calls and you're door knocking, yeah. is that is that because I, I just remember back in the days of Delta McGinty and Ka uh, Kathleen Wynne when I was in Ontario, like things never happened last minute. It always was pre-planned. How do the liberals start making that and showing that we are planning if we are fortunate to have uh, uh, government in the next election? This is our plan because you have until June to roll out your platform. Are you going to be doing yeah. that sooner rather than later? Or are you going to wait till next year when sort of start, people start focusing in on the election? Yeah, so I, I think the way we show them we have a plan is we literally have a plan. So <laughs> last summer and, you know, I think early June, if I'm not mistaken, or, or maybe early July, but well before school was back, we released a safe return to school plan. And it was based on consultation with experts, including uh, educators, parents, people in the health community to say, here is what we would do. Uh, it included notably things like a capped class size. It included uh, huge investment in capital upgrades, specifically ventilation in schools. It included mental health supports because we know this transition has been really tough. We released a second safe return to school plan this summer. And I think that was at the end of June and very detailed. Um, kind of board by board level, here is what you would be seeing if we were the government right now. And again, that was not what happened uh, provincially. Um, I also know teachers who did not know what grade they'd be teaching, what, what space would be provided. I teach at the university level. We didn't know whether there would be, you know, restrictions on the capacity and so on right up until school was actually starting. And frankly, it's ridiculous. It's already a really stressful time of year all the time for educators, for parents, for students, and to leave those big decisions till not even like the 11th hour, like 10 minutes into the actual school year starting is, it, it's, it, I think it speaks to lots of disagreement, um, you know, within the provincial cabinet and so on, but the people who it really leaves uh, in the lurch are those who need the support of their provincial government the most. So we have tried to not just say, you know, we need a plan and we need to be more, uh, more in front of this, but actually do. And so we've released those plans. We've invited other parties, including the current provincial government to copy, steal, take from them. If there's anything here that's helpful, no monopoly here on good ideas. We want kids to be safe. And so, yeah, so we've, I actually feel really proud of the policy work that we as a party have done during the campaign. It, unfortunately, it hasn't translated into a smoother return to school, at least not yet. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's how we're trying to demonstrate that we would be different than the current provincial government. One of the big news stories that I saw, and this is me uh, watching politics from Ontario from here in Calgary, was uh, your, the, the Ontario Liberal leader came out in October and said that uh, if uh, elected in 2022, they, uh, the Ontario Liberals would pass electoral reform. Uh, yep. This was a massive uh, change because he then followed up by saying if he didn't get it done, he would quit. And a lot of people went, OK, <laughs> that that He's someone serious. someone willing to give up power is quite, quite different in today's age. Um, yep. Electoral reform is usually not on the top of everyone's mind, but the Ontario Liberals have made it a point to talk about electoral reform going into the next election with that announcement back in October. Why? Yep. 
why is this important? Because uh, people might be wondering, okay, you just talked about kids and students and healthcare and long-term care, but why is electoral reform big for the Ontario Liberals in the next election? Yeah, so one thing, so Stephen's main message when he announced this, it was at the Ontario Liberal Party's AGM. And uh, the main message was about needing to see a change in politics where parties can actually work together. And I do believe that he is right on the target of what people want to see right now, you know, through chaos, through, we've all gone through this uh, time of crisis and people are fed up with the partisan bickering and, you know, who's getting the credit and so on. They want to see parties who can work together, especially on the big things. And so Stephen, I think very wisely said that we are, we are prepared to govern quite differently. Uh, He reflected himself personally as somebody who's been in politics for, you know, coming up around 30 years that uh, this would be a big change even for him. And so committing to working with other party leaders, uh, putting changes in in place that encourage more collaboration between parties, encourage more listening, uh, change the dynamic of campaigns where the incentives are less about beating up on your opponent and more about finding uh, places where there's common ground to be able to work together. That was the the message that he was giving to us as a party, uh, certainly at our AGM, but I think also more broadly to Ontarians about You know, once we get to the campaign, this is the new Ontario Liberal Party that you can expect. We are a party of people who want to find solutions, and we are quite prepared to work with other parties, even to levels that we haven't seen ever, unfortunately, uh, in Ontario before. Uh, We're prepared to work with others who share the same goals that we do. So that was, uh, I think, a very different kind of message from the party and one that I was really happy to see Stephen uh, lean into, uh, even as we're months away from the election, because I, I do believe it's what Ontarians are looking for right now, uh, especially when it comes to addressing big things like climate inequality, uh, addressing problems in our healthcare and education system. We've got to see more collaboration. What we're doing right now is just not working. So how do you collaborate? How does, how does the Ontario Liberals collaborate? Because you, just, you mentioned a few times that you've put stuff out and you said, steal it, take it. Best idea always is the best idea. But you have two opposite, two parties right now, the governing Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario and the New Democratic Party of Ontario, hopefully I'm getting that name correctly, it might be the Ontario New Democratic Party, but the NDP and the PCs who are at loggerheads right now, they they yeah. are fighting each other left, right and center, and they don't want, they want their ideas to win and no one else's idea to win. So how do you collaborate in a very divisive political arena that is Queen's Park right now, because I've been watching some of those live readings and some of the things that people say, I go, what is going on in Queen's Park these days? Well, I, and I, I think most people, when they look at it, they, like no functional workplace in the world works like that, right? Great. If you worked in a place where literally everyone around you was campaigning for your demise all the time, you know, I think most logical, rational people look at that and say, that is not a system that would produce good decisions and good outcomes. So we do need to see a dramatic change in the way we do politics. Things like electoral reform change the incentives. I think that can be one uh, one step in the right direction. But more broadly, I think we need to focus more on people and problems and less on kind of partisan interests. So let me give you one example that, you know, I think it was a perfect opportunity for collaboration and, and it just, it didn't happen the way that it could have. So paid sick days became a real focal point during the campaign because there were outbreaks in workplaces where people were going to work sick, spreading it to their colleagues because they had literally no other choice. You know, if you've, you're a single parent, you've got mouths to feed at home. You need to be going in for those hours to be able to pay your rent or get your groceries. And so uh, this was actually led by Peggy Sattler, uh, an NDP MPP from London, just a terrific woman and leader. She put forward a fantastic uh, bill. And uh, I think generally speaking, people across partisan stripes said, yeah, that is a good thing. The Ontario Liberal Party put forward a bill uh, that was quite similar, but said, we will support Peggy's bill. And if this doesn't happen, here's one that we're going to change. It was just a difference in the number of days, if I'm not mistaken. But both parties said, yes, we would we would support one another in seeing this happen. The Greens also came forward and said, yeah, we think that's good. We're prepared to do this. And it took months and months of public pressure. The social media campaign, which is out of control before, finally, we saw the Ford government do the right thing and uh, and make some changes, although not as much as what was, what was being proposed. So, you know, where there is something and, you know, generally speaking, Ontarians are looking for 
for a specific action, it's very clear that it's going to solve it, uh, in that case, like a very acute immediate problem. Uh, it should be something where it is less about who holds power and who gets to say and more about let's just find a way to work together and get this done. And so, you know, I do think there were some, there were some efforts. There were certainly lots of collaboration between the NDP, the Green and the Liberals talking about supporting one another in this. And it would be great if we could see all parties uh, on, on issues that are of particular importance or urgency rising above the partisan garbage and just saying, yes, we all agree with this and we're happy to share in the credit when it gets done. Journalism is in crisis, and our mission here at the Cross Border Interview Podcast is to tell the story that isn't being told. It is vital that independent journalism survives with the rise of fake news. Every penny that is contributed to the Cross Border Interview Podcast goes to help continue our work to tell people's stories. All of our content is produced and edited by our team. The Cross Border Interview Podcast provides entirely free content, and we will never hide stories behind paywalls. By supporting a new model of journalism, our listeners, like you, are supporting real, independent journalism. Consider making a monthly donation via our Patreon account, or make a one-time donation by Interact eTransfer. Now, let's get Get back to the show. I am just cautious of time here, and I want to turn to a local Sorry. campaign now. No, I just because I love this I conversation. <laughs> but, hey, I love it. If you did, it would be a very bad audio podcast. So um, <laughs> I, I want to turn to the local campaign now, and by local, I mean the <laughs> London North Center campaign because. This will be your second time running. You are up against an NDP incumbent. Um, this is the NDP have never have not taken this riding in a long time. Deb Matthews, Diane Cunningham before that. Uh, this is my Ontario history coming out now. And I very I, well I, done. <laughs> um, I have all their buttons as well. Um, okay. <laughs> what what do you need to do? What do you need to do in London North Center to get connected? Because you you, you I, we listed off your list of job titles that you have going into this next election, platform, co-chair, uh, vice chair of the campaign, you need to win your seat as well. How do you become the next member of provincial parliament, MPP, for those who are listening outside of Ontario, um, in, in 2022? Sure. Well, so I am uh, I'm running, I, I like to say alongside instead of against, but uh, our, our incumbent is a terrific guy named Terrence Kernahan. And uh, I think he's been doing uh, a fine job over the last three years. So for me, running again is not, it's not against him. Uh, it is more about wanting to see a change in our provincial government. So in London North Centre, most voters are progressive. Uh, the many, many elections results will tell you that. It is just a question of, um, you know, in the last election, people were asking who is more likely to defeat Doug Ford. The NDP was polling ahead of the Liberals, and it wasn't more complicated than that. Yeah. And so we need to put forward a vision that uh, the majority, uh, I hope, or a large number of Ontarians say, yes, that is the direction that we would like to go. And uh, and I think we will see many of the urban progressive ridings that, you know, in midsize and large cities all across the province that uh, flipped NDP. I think we need to show that we have a, a vision that they can stand behind and that we are a party that they can trust. And, but I, again, I think for most, you know, when I'm knocking on doors, it is not, people are not talking about the NDP versus the Liberals. They want to see a change. They, they want to see a new premier. And, uh, and that's really what the, what the local race has been all about, at least for me so far, is asking people, you know, do we want to continue with our current provincial government or is it time for a change? And I believe people are looking for a change. Is that the big issue that the 2022 election is going to be talked about is, do we need change in this government because of their handling of COVID-19? Because you talked earlier in the uh, broadcast about people are a little bit more sympathetic to party leaders right now because of what's going on. But we have seen in Nova, Sco in Nova Scotia, the yep. liberals get turfed out to the progressive conservatives because of their handling of COVID-19. Um, while people are sympathetic, are Ontarians, and I only can I only can mention from my family, and I am in a vacuum when it comes to what is being told at, uh, on the ground in London North Centre, but are people in London North Centre saying it's 
we need something different. This isn't working for us. We, we tried something different in the last election and it did, it's not getting us results that we wanted. Yeah, <laughs> this is a good question. One, I, I'm, I spent a lot of time thinking about it and I'm not, I'm not even gonna pretend like I have this, you know, it, I totally understand exactly what the narrative is, but I, I think in 2018, it was a, it's time for a change. The current provincial government has to go. We heard it over and over and over again at the door. It didn't really matter who the next option was. It was just not gonna be the liberal. So I like to think of that result as less the PCs won and more that we lost, Yeah, right? People were fed I, up and it was time for a change. And I it think everyone like can that. agree to that. <laughs> yeah, so it was a like, it's time for a change. Uh, you know, Ford ran on like buck a beer and won, right? Like it was, it was not a big vision kind of campaign. It was like a, we lost moment. So this time it's not, it's not this, it's not a, you know, we're tired of this and it's time for a change for change sake. But I think when people go to the polls, they'll be looking at the current option or can we do better? And so showing that Ontario deserves better, Ontario can have better. We have a plan for better when it comes to education, healthcare, climate, and so on. That will be the central message, I think, that will resonate uh, with at least the people that I've been speaking to in London North Centre. It's not that, you know, they've grown tired of Ford. And again, you know, you've seen, I think we've had, what, eight pandemic elections in Canada now, most of which have seen the current uh, government return to power. I do think there's a lot of sympathy. So it needs to be a different kind of change message. It's not just change for change's sake, it's change for something. So running on a really positive, bold plan um, that includes, you know, the things that people are looking for and care about most is I think the kind of change campaign that we will need to run uh, to be successful. But again, yeah. I'm not gonna pretend that I have the answers yet. This is why we're doing so much door knocking. Yeah. We need to hear from people about what they want. That's That will be what informs, you know, ultimately the direction, the path that we take. Um, I was not going to ask this question, but I'm going to ask it because we have a bit of time and I just want to make sure I get this on record because yes. you mentioned that 2018 was the, the, the liberals were taken out of office. They were shown the door oh, yeah. and in, the, in one of the worst defeats in Ontario's history for the Ontario liberals ever, if not the worst. Yes, every single new candidate lost, myself included, and basically the whole, like for people who don't follow Ontario politics, it was like, a very significant historic defeat. Yeah. Um, when you're knocking on doors, and I say this with all respect, are people telling you that the liberals have 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 earned their time out and they're willing to come willing to look at the Ontario Liberals again? Because I can there's a lot of elections that I ran in Durham in uh, Northumberland, in P Prince Edward Hastings when I was there covering uh, politics. And when the Liberals were turfed from the, when Lou Rinaldi was defeated, when Leon Dombrowski was defeated, there was a lot of people saying, the Liberals haven't learned their lesson in this writing, so we're not gonna look at them. Are people looking at the Ontario Liberals because when you have a leader who was in the McGuinty government, who was in the uh, Wynn government as well, people might look at it and go, <sighs> have you gotten the message we wanted something different but you have a leader who was part of that government as well does that make sense yeah yeah no i i so i uh, and again I, I, maybe that i'm seeing things through uh rose colored glasses here but uh i you know our numbers went like bounced right back up in the polls very shortly after the 2018 election so there was a clear message to be sent but i don't think that you know the base of liberal support in Ontario had eroded. I think it was a message. And then we immediately kind of bounced back up into a competitive range. And we're in a very competitive place right now, even though we don't have official party status or the kinds of resources that party status comes with. So I think we are going to be able to, um, you know, in terms of we have a leader who has more experience at Queen's Park than the Premier, but a team of largely brand new candidates and a very, very impressive team of candidates. You know, we've got over 60% women, about 50% from underrepresented communities, unbelievably successful, accomplished uh, professional backgrounds of the full lot of, of candidates that are stepping forward. So in most ridings, there will be a new face and someone who is running for the first time or sometimes the second time, but someone who is fairly new to politics, but also a, a long standing and long trusted, I believe. A party brand and a leader who's got lots of experience. So I think that combination will feel 
quite different to people from what they've seen in the past. It doesn't look any more like a tired party that's been in government for a long time. It feels and looks like a new party, but that has some of the benefits of a party that has held power for a long time, like experience, like knowledge, like credibility. So again, I'm not going to pretend that I have yeah. all the answers or have sorted out exactly what Ontarians will see our brand as, but I do think there are a few things really running in our favor, including a very experienced leader paired with a super exciting, dynamic new slate of uh, faces stepping forward to serve. I appreciate you answering that. And just, uh, it just I, I see that we're closing in on that 30 minute mark. And I'm going to ask my last question here. And this question is for you to direct it to the listeners of Ontario. And we have people from Peterborough, we have people from Thunder Bay, Ottawa, uh, like I said, Newcastle, where I'm originally from, go Newcastle right, Public yeah. School, Clark High School. <laughs> whoop, whoop. Um, talk to the people who are listening right now. Talk to the people who are listening from Ontario. Why should they look at the Ontario Liberals? You, you mentioned it a little bit beforehand, but talk about the future. Talk about why they should uh, look at the Ontario Liberals and why they should potentially put their trust in the Ontario Liberals in 2022. Sure. So politics is about people. Uh, myself and other Ontario Liberals are in this because we want to improve the quality of life for the people in this province. And we heard you in 2018. Uh, we got a, a message loud and clear. I knocked on tens of thousands of doorsteps and listened to sometimes screaming, sometimes uh, a little quieter. But many, many people talk about where they felt like um, our government and our party had gone astray and that we had lost touch, that we had stopped listening to you and that we no longer reflected the things that you want for your family and your community. And we heard that message loud and clear. So we have worked very hard over the last three years to reconnect with you, to hear from you, to listen to you, and to build a party that reflects what we believe you're looking for. Uh, it is not a coincidence that you're seeing the most diverse slate of candidates in Ontario's history stepping forward. It is not a coincidence that you're seeing people who are deeply rooted in their communities and have a long time of community service and are finally, this is their moment to step forward in political service. It's not a coincidence that you hear our leader, Simon El Duca, putting forward big ideas like, um, you know, we were the first to call for mandatory vaccinations, like our safe return to school plan, and like a very real commitment to changing the way we do politics. So the short version of the message would be, we heard you, we are doing our best to uh, re-earn your support and would love the opportunity to work with you to make this uh, an even better province to live in uh, after the 2022 election, if given the privilege. Um, Kate, I want to thank you so much for doing this. It has been an honor and a pleasure. And yeah. uh, like I said, I feel like I haven't gotten like even I haven't scratched the surface on you because during your leadership <laughs> ran, you were pregnant as well. You have the yep. uh, No Second Chances podcast as well i feel like we, we we could sit down for another half hour 45 minutes and continue this conversation well but let's do this again then yeah we, we, we will leave out, but let's talk about any time um well on, on that note i should mention to my viewers that come june once the official election is called we are taking the show on the road and we will be back in Ontario Yay, covering the great. election the entire time, talking to candidates from all across Ontario, but on the ground with our video equipment, with our producers, talking to candidates and also people in Ontario, because this, uh, this election is important and we want to make sure that we're on the ground talking about it as well. So Kate, thank you so much for doing this. And I look forward to talking to you in June when the election is called. In London I was North Center. Say, well, put, <laughs> put London North Center. I hope early on the agenda, come out door knocking with me. We can, uh, yeah, Let's, we'd love to host you in the city and I'll grab kick a off button the election or towards the end. Very, yes, and I will definitely make sure there's a button for your wall uh, for you. But it's been a treat. Thank you very much for the invitation and would love to talk again anytime.